So tonight we're going to be looking at stress bays and reels, but we'll also discuss a little bit about the marches, which we should put with them as well, because obviously our standard format of playing the stress bays and reels has proceeded with a march. So tonight, as we look through some of the things we'll discuss, relationship between tempos and things like that between the between the march, the stress bay, and of course the reel. So um, um, hopefully I've stalled long enough here that everyone's downloaded um, and we can kick away. So first of all, the first tune that we are looking at is Craig Bodick, which is uh, Strats Bay, of course. So as with any piece of music, there's some musical instructions on the page and the first one says Strats Bay, which gives us an idea as to how we're gonna play the tune. Strass Bay obviously is a uniquely Scottish dance idiom which has a snap to it and the snap's achieved by holding the dotted notes and cutting the cut notes quite short. Um, we're probably double dotting the, the quavers through most of a Strass Bay and therefore turning the semi-quavers into quite often demi-semi-quavers and they'll obviously vary in terms of their length as well. Um, if they were all the same, we'd be playing the whole tune with no accent. So obviously that's quite important to us. Um, the next musical instruction that we get on the page, aside from the clef, which is the blindingly obvious, is... Um, is our time signature. And the time signature on this is a C and the C denotes that it's common or four four time. So we have four beats in the bar. When we have four beats in the bar, the standard method of accenting is strong weak, medium weak. So you'll see under the first bar, I've indicated which notes are which strength, so there's an S, W, M and W written under the notes, which of course is our strong weak, medium weak. And that will go through most bars. But the thing that we should look at too is obviously we have to incorporate phrasing in that as well. So you'll see in 4-4 four, four time, we generally play one bar phrases. Sometimes in stress bass, you can look at the the nature of the tune and say, well, you know, that might be two bars to a phrase, but that's reasonably rare in stress bass. Generally, the one bar phrase is quite common. So we obviously have to have pause at the end of each bar to give us a comma so that we're not just rambling straight through the tune. And in this tune, the phrases are are clearly indicated where we have a fairly long note at the end of each phrase. Um, so the tune kind of plays itself phrasing wise. Um, if we have a look, um, we've got straight beats. We're not too worried about, about up beats through a stress bait. We're worried about the, the counting of four for each part and that's the nature of the dance. So for those of you who've seen a girl or a young boy or whatever doing the Highland Fling, they're bouncing and a ball doesn't bounce down, bounces up. So whenever they're jumping, we've got an expression which is moving in an upward motion all the time. So our downward beats are generally going to be sharp and, and we're cutting quite hard through the tune. Uh, we need to look very closely when learning the tune at beat placement because obviously being a dance, beat placement is everything. If we haven't got a good solid beat going through a stress bay, we're not playing it as a dance. So if we have a look at the first bar in the tune there, we have a tall earth for the first note group. So We've got a, a crotchet being our first low A, and then we have a tall earth. And generally, I would look at playing the E grace note at the end of the tall earth on that second beat. Um, we move down holding the note after the tall earth, 
we move down sharply off the B to the low G, which is giving us our medium beat. And then we've got two short semi-quavers written there, both of which I would play at slightly different lengths. I'd play the first one slightly longer than the second one, which I would use to cut up very hard onto the E at the end of the bar, which finishes our phrase. So I'd be holding that E at the end of the phrase. So the first bar would become... <laughs> Okay, so you can hear hopefully the slightly different length in those last two semi quavers before we move up to the end of the phrase. So when we look at the second bar, the second bar is similar at the start in structure. So we do the same thing. Now in there, we again have our short semi quavers and again, the first one, which is the D, would be longer than the, the uh, semi-quaver E, which cuts up to the high G and finishes the phrase. So again, we're looking at strong. We're still holding the weak beat after the tall earth for a reasonable amount of time. We're giving a reasonable value to the semi-quaver B. Now, if we make that B very short, we turn the low A at the end of the tall lueth into another strong B. So we're, we're bleeding some time away from that second B into the, into the um, little and note that moves in there, moving up to the E, which is our medium beat. So we're holding that. We then pause slightly on the D and use that as a lever to come up with a very clean and sharp E, which moves up to the high G, finishing the phrase. Okay, moving on to the next bar, we're then looking at our strong weak, medium weak again. So, Again, we're looking at those little semi-quavers as being different values. So the one with the grace note on it, which is on the beat, is cut very sharply up to the D, finishing the phrase. And the last bar... So we have a crotchet at the end, which finishes the, the line of the tune in quite a strong manner. So that finishes phrase, finishes our line. That's our whole first line done. So if we have a listen to the first line, we've got um, very strong phrasing going through. Okay, so We'll be moving through a march to progress to the Strass Bay. When we kick it off, I would be giving extra value to the first note of the Strass Bay. So I'd be starting the tune slightly slower than what I'd be playing it at. So that way you break in with strength you're not set to a specific tempo when you hit the tune, but you're pretty close to where you want to be. If you're playing a march and the march is very controlled in tempo, then of course you don't want to break into the Strass Bay at a million miles an hour and then have to slow down to a tempo which is suitable with the march. So that's a fairly bad habit that you often hear and, and something you shouldn't hear. You should hear the stress base start with a lot of strength and control and build up very slightly. Um, and again, if the march is very controlled, the stress base should be quite controlled in terms of tempo, but you have to be conscious that a stress base dance tune, so you can't play it too slow. It has to be played in the correct idiom and it has to be played at a correct tempo. But we also have to bear in mind that 
correct tempo is going to be gauged somewhat by the capabilities of the band playing the Strats Bay because Strats Bay's played quite fast for dancing, but we're not playing them for dancing. The dancers will complain and carry on if we play them too slow, but if we're playing them as a band in competition, we want to play them cleanly and we want to play them within a tempo that the band's capable of playing. So you shouldn't be in a position where you can play a march at a million miles an hour and then have to s slow down to a halt to play the Strass Bay. If the band is capable of playing the Strass Bay at a moderate tempo, you should keep the march at a moderate tempo to balance it out. Um, second part of the Strass Bay. So the second part starts with an E hit, which is unusual if you're kicking off at the start of the start of the part. But again, the, the, the second part of the Strass Bay is very similar to the first. Very strong phrase ends. Um, and of course, these little um, timing variances in the short notes are going to give you the character to the Strass Bay. Um, the first line of the second part, Right, and very similar with the second line where we start the same. And then we go back to very similar section to the first part. All right, so there's a few new things to learn in the second part there, but there's also a lot of familiarity as we go through it as well the key factors are going to be making sure that your grace noting, your doublings are played on the beat and where they're supposed to be on the beat. So they're actually playing the tune, not a, not a semblance of the tune. Um, and that we get that snap. The snap is all important. If we haven't got the snap, it's not a stress bay. That's what stress bay playing is all about. It's that jumping motion. It's the upward bouncing. And where we've got the high hand notes, they should be hanging. So we've got in the first bar of the second bar. You know, we move through, to me, the strongest note in that whole bar is the high A, where we're giving the high A absolute full value. It finishes the phrase off. That's the note where we're kind of leaning through the bar. Again, the high A's get the value. That gives you the hanging time. Okay, so that should give you a stress bay with some colour and some character to it. It's giving you a clearly structured stress bay where you've got your, your strong weak, medium weak coming through. You've got your ends of phrases. So anybody listening to the tune knows where you're up to. They can hear that it makes sense. It's like a piece of poetry. You've got your commas, you've got full stops and the tune makes sense. Uh, if anyone wants to field any questions regarding the stress bay, now's a good time because we'll move on and have a look at the, um, the real. While they're thinking about it, Brett, I'd like to add a, a comment out of my own experience judging. Absolutely. Uh, you've talked about uh, in the, the stress bay, strong week, medium week. This is important. Um, and I quite often hear a band where I can tell that they're not producing that. I'll be out there judging the first two bars, I'll find I'm hearing not that sort of a rhythm. And every time I look and I see that the pipe major and the bass drummer are beating their foot two beats per bar, every yeah. time. Yeah. It, it's almost a given that if I'm hearing that rhythm not right, that's what's going on. So it's important you think in terms of four beats per bar, it's a common fault to be beating only two because your foot gets tired. 
Yeah, well, that's a really good point, and we'll we'll look at that in even more detail in the reel. But but Gary's a hundred percent correct that you know there's four beats in the bar, and you have to be playing all of those beats accurately, and all of them must bounce as well. If you're not getting that lift and that bounce through the tune, you're missing out on the on the whole idiom of a stress bait. But similarly. If you go through and you play strong, 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 the stress bay doesn't make sense. You have to get that slight leaning on that strong and medium beat. You know, so some bars don't lend themselves to it, but it's got to be overall, it's got to be the overriding factor in a stress bay is that you get that strong weak, medium weak. And if it's not lending itself in the pipe score, you find that there's every opportunity there for at least the bass drum to be highlighting it. So while you're there, Brett, there's been a question on that topic, which is, does the strong week, medium week change with the hanging high notes? Well, you find often that the hanging high notes are actually often on the strong or the medium or at the end of the phrase. So yeah, you might find if you're wanting to hang on to a note longer that it fits itself to something other than the strong week, medium week. And quite often you'll find some bars often lend themselves to uh, a weak, weak, strong, weak accenting or something very similar, but it depends on the note structure of the bar. So with every tune, you know, we give you guidance as to what the general structure is, but there's always the opportunity to analyse the tune and work out any bar that varies from that standard formula. But generally, the tune has to fit into that structure. And it's got to be consistent the way through the tune too, because, you know, if it's not consistent, <laughs> you're not getting that accenting, you're not getting that strength of beat going through, then anything that varies from the strict timing of the tune is not going to produce an effect of a, of, a, of a good dance tune. And that's what it is. Stress bays and reels have to be played as a dance. You know, that's the basic idiom. Your march is clearly something to march to, but your stress bay and reel obviously aren't. They have to be a dance. Anything else there, Gary? Uh, there's a question on tempo, but I think that's probably better discussed when we compare with reels and maybe marches as well, all at the same time. Yeah, okay, what's the, give me the question there, because if I've got it, I can... How many beats per minute would you recommend for a stress bay? Oh, well, yeah, see, that's our, that's our key, isn't it? Because it's going to depend on the, on the tempo of the march and the tempo of the, of the reel. But generally, a stress bay is kind of around the 120, 124 beats per minute mark, I'd say. That'd be, um... That'd be reasonable stress bay tempo. And as I said before, if you if you're not capable of playing it at that tempo, you can still play it a lot slower and still get the same lift and the, the same effect in there. Um, you don't want to play it too fast. You lose all of that. So you know that's something you should bear in mind is that you do have a a strict limit on how quick you want to play a stress bay because you'll get to the point where it's where it's no longer a stress bay. So if we move on and we look at the reel, um, the, the sheet of music tells us that it's a reel at the top of the page, which is obviously extremely important to us because we're now changing to a completely different idiom. So we have three idioms in when we play a march, stress bay and reel. We've got the march, we've got the stress bay, we've got the reel the tune tells us what it is at the top of the page and it gives us a time signature, which is the C with a line through it, which is cut common time, which is two, two. So we have two beats in each bar. Each beat is a, is a minimum, a half note. And they're obviously divided into, um, into four note quaver groups or, or, two crotchet groups or something similar. Um, but you find in a reel often you've got the crotchets that you lean on that give you the, the give you the expression through the tune. And you've got these little four note groups which all vary in terms of how they should be expressed. Um, 
the the two tunes here i should say have been selected because they're they're small two-parted tunes which gives us the ability to cover them in a in a short seminar like this but also both of these tunes are of a structure where they could actually be bigger tunes and they give you the the feel and the idiom of how either small tunes or big tunes could be played so the kilt is my delight is a tune that i often use for demonstrating to pupils the idiom that we have in reels we break the the um, bars up so we've got two beats in the bar obviously the accenting is strong and weak and that's the same with any duple time tune so if it's two four or or two two or if it's six eight we've got two beats in the bar first one's a strong beat which is our left foot beat and the second one's a, a weak beat we then have an upbeat. So if we have a look at the first group of notes, I've indicated with a small arrow there where the beat is. And I've also indicated with a small arrow where the upbeat is. So I personally prefer to play reels with quite a strong upbeat. And I point reels reasonably heavily, not too heavy but I give reels a fair amount of pointing. You often hear them played quite round. I would point a little more than that. All right, that's the, that's the style of reel playing that I was taught to play. Um, but the upbeats are very heavy. So quite often, instead of hum ba da i hum ba da i hum, I'd be playing hum ba da i dum ba da i hum ba da i he ba dum. And the, and the upbeat becomes reasonably dominant. So you'll hear people that come out with different ways of accenting it, but that's just the way that I would do it. So if we have a look at the first bar, <laughs> So the E grace note on these G, D and E's is the upbeat. And that D is the upbeat. So we have the beat going through and we have the upbeat. Okay, so there's a, there's a, a double beat that goes through there. When I learn a reel, I will double tap it. So I won't be doing hum ba da i dum ba da i dum ba da i he ba da. I'll be learning a real to hum ba da i dum ba da i dum ba da i he ba da. All right, that gives you accuracy. It's it's important to get accuracy through the reels. It's important to get the upbeats through. It gives you the same thing that you're getting from your stress bay, in that it's giving you the correct idiom for the dance that is meant to accompany the tune. So I've got the phrases marked on the music there. They're two bar phrases. And we have an anacrusis. So there's an anacrusis at the start of the tune. And there's also an anacrusis at the start of the second phrase. So you'll see where I've marked the phrase ending and the next phrase beginning is in the middle of a note group because we have an anacrusis there into the next phrase. So if we have a look at the first phrase, that's where the phrase finishes. That's the only place it can finish. The next one, And that's your, your end phrase on the part. All right, so you hear there's a very short pause, a comma 
in the in the center phrase there, the 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 center part of the line, which gives you that phrase. Um, and the the tempo that the reel is played at has to be in balance with the stress bay. So again, if we're playing a moderate tempo stress bay, we play a moderate tempo reel. The reel, however, has to be in balance with the march. So if we're playing a march, um, the the march that we had. Um, <laughs> There's a similarity in tempo between the march and the reel. The way that I do it is I look at the reel as being exactly the same tempo as the march and then I lift it. So I would usually play my reel slightly faster than I would play the march. Um, that's my preferred way of doing it. I find if I match the march, usually the reel's a little bit slow. Um, you want it to be bright, you want it to be dance-like, um, so I do lift it very slightly, only a small amount. Uh, Gary? Yes. You would agree with that? Overall, yes. Uh, the march and the reel, I'd be uh, saying it should be about the same. I yep. wouldn't be actually setting myself a goal of lifting my reel above the march. I'd be setting myself a guideline that says they're typically going to be similar. Yep. And then looking how I play them and how the band's playing them and figuring out what they can achieve around about that mark rather than trying to make it work to a number. Yep. Yep. Wise advice. Wise advice. So if we move on and we look at the next part, we've got exactly the same thing happening where we're going to be looking at the beat and we're going to be looking at the upbeats. And if you have a look at the first bar in that second part, I've marked the beats and I've marked the upbeats and the upbeats all high A's, okay? So they get a good value. We've got crotchets for the, for the, for the beats. So they're obviously gonna be longer, but we're giving good value to the upbeat. That's where our phrase finishes. So there's our phrase structure through the tune. So learning the tune, I would be double tapping it and I would be playing it in phrases. I wouldn't be playing it straight through. I'd be learning it in phrases, getting the phrase structure built into the noggin um, and then move on to playing it as a whole tune, hopefully then with strong phrasing. So again, that second part, we're looking at these upbeats. Okay. Da he a dum he a dum ba dum be he ba dum be da he a dum he a dum ba dum be da. You know those those upbeats have to be precisely placed. They're not precisely placed. You lose all that rhythmical structure. So the tune has to be fitting in with that beat and pulse. Um, most of the little idiosyncrasies through there are similar to what we've seen in the first part. But to me, it's all about rhythm in a reel. We have to get that slightly dot cut effect. We don't want to overcook that. We'll slow the tune down if we do it too much. Um, and it's got to sound bright. It's got to be relaxed with playing it. And the phrases have to be shown clearly. Uh, anything you want to comment on that, Gary? You've covered most of the things I think about. Um, once again, the uh, beating double time, as you suggested, is a good way to learn the reel. To express it well in the finish, you don't want to be beating double time, but it is a good learning method. Yeah, no, I wouldn't be, um, I wouldn't be double tapping it whilst I was actually playing it up on pipes. So yeah. you know, that's the that's other thing is a learning um, method. Yeah. 
Sorry. I like to think of the real being not so much pointed as expressed. It, it amounts to the same thing in the finish. I really think hard about stress space being strongly pointed. Yep. Reels being well expressed. When I'm beating time to a stress bay, my foot will be thumping on the floor. When I'm beating time to a reel, I'm still beating my foot on the floor, but I'm actually bending my knees up and down, which gives me the psychological effect of just softening that pointing a bit in, uh, in uh, the characterization of a reel. So it's still expressed and pointed, just a little more softly. Well, that's a good point. And one of the things that we obviously have to bear in mind is that we've got three completely different idioms that we have to fit together. And so, you know, the march will be very structured in terms of its rhythm. Um, when we get onto the stress bait, we've got to have that bounce and then we've got to smoothen out to play the reel. And so any judge who's listening to a March stress bay and reel being played is listening for those three distinct idioms. You don't want to hear a reel that sounds like a stress bay or a stress bay that just moves on from the march. So not only do you want to hear three different idioms, but you want to hear three different tempo as well. Um, if you're not getting that, you're not getting the, the variation that you need through the tunes. Um, the other thing, Brett, while you're there, uh, before we move off uh, that topic as such, the contrast between the entry into a stress bay and a reel. I was taught in my early days that you hit a, a stress bay straight on tempo, but I do think I agree that the first note, the first beat is very yep. important in a stress bay. Yep. With a reel, you tend to take a little bit longer to build that tempo up as you... Correct. I'd do it with both, but as you say, I would certainly take longer to do it with a reel than I would with a stress bay. The stress bay, the first note, I would give a very strong value to. Um, but within, within the first two beats, I'd be pretty much to the tempo that I want to be playing at. With a reel, it might take me the first bar before I get into the tempo that I want to be playing at. That would be about, the, about the, the time that you would take, I would assume, Gary. Yeah, for me, it's usually two or three beats. Yep. Around about that, in a reel. Yep. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, do we have any questions on the, on the reel? Nothing specific to the reel, but there was an interesting question about how you, uh, on pipes, make a strong accent. I've, I've given an answer to that one, but you might want to add an extra comment to it, Brett. Yeah, well, look, you give a strong accent through a number of tools that, that we have at our disposal. You would ensure with a strong beat that you're making sure that the grace noting is strong at the start of it. Um, the first thing is that usually a strong beat has a G grace note on, which of course is the strongest grace note that we have being higher, higher up in the charter. So usually the beat is formed with G grace notes and the others are left for passing notes. So you ensure where you've got a strong beat, you give it a strong grace note at the start and then you give it absolute maximum value. So, you know, as I explained when we were looking at the first bar of the Strass Bay, where you've got the weak beats, the note following is probably slightly longer than the note following a strong beat. And therefore you get that slight leaning on notes where you get strong, weak, medium, weak following through. Now that's not particularly easy to do and it's absolute subtleties, but that's what makes it a stress bay. So those, um, those little uh, variances are like the, um, I like the Beethoven comment where he says that music is in the space between the notes. Well, we don't have that luxury. So we have grace noting, which, which gives us the break between notes. And we also have the, um, the length of notes following to play around with a little. So that's what gives us the ability to make strong weak, medium weak, is the ability to lean on some of these notes a little longer and some ability to chop around the values of the shorter notes following. I presume that's the answer you gave, Gary. Not no, I was right and you were wrong. No, no, that's it. <laughs> pretty, much the same. pretty much the same. Yeah. <laughs> Probably didn't have as much uh, a time there with the fingers hitting the keyboard as, uh, as me <laughs> waffling. 
Um, yeah, any, any other questions on those ones? Uh, not at the moment, although there was a question about using a metronome and uh, I hate metronomes. They're very frustrating to use, but they can help you once you're familiar with the tune to actually get the timing more accurate. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, um, I'm not a huge fan of metronomes for the fact that um, I quite often find that they make people play mechanically. But I think that they're a good tool to use when you're first learning a tune. You know, when you go through and you play tunes, um, particularly marches, I find, you, f you, you get the first couple of parts of the march, which are, um, which are very civilised, and then you hit the third part, which becomes extremely busy. And it's very easy to go through and slow down the third parts to a, a, a degree where it's noticeable. As a soloist, you will usually slow down the busy parts and put a bit more expression into it, but they still have to roll along. So, um, you know, the ability to sit down with a metronome and do it, reels where you've got big reels that um, have a lot of parts and it has a rhythmical structure that you have to maintain through, through busy parts. A, a metronome's a great idea whilst you're learning the tunes, but then move away from it and get the character of the tune in there. Um, a couple of things I guess we should touch on if we're looking at stress bays and reels. I think the first thing in stress bays that's not covered in this tune is the round movement. <laughs> that movement is, um, is a feature in most stress bays. Um, it must be played on the beat, so you have to give full consideration to the beat note before the round movement so that it starts exactly on the beat. Uh, quite often you'll find the short notes before them are lent on slightly. Um, but that movement is learnt nice and open. And when we put it into a tune, we have to cut it down, but ensure that it's clean. All right, so if we put it into a tune. All right, they all have to start on the beat. So it's very common to hear all of those round movements played. If they're played in a row, it's quite often to hear a number of them, and as you progress, the notes between them get shorter and shorter and shorter, and your beat gets faster and faster and faster. So very important to hold the notes before those round movements and make sure that they start exactly on the beat. And that's a feature of stress bay playing, so that's very important. And again, in a real tackens, <laughs> You know, the Tecum exercise in the Logan's Tudor, the real exercise. You know, it features in the Sheep Wife. You know, you have doublings followed by Tecums. They all have to fit on the beat. So you've got to have the doubling starting on the beat, the tecum has to start on the beat, and they're strong, and then softly down. All right, um, has to be clean. I firmly believe tecums are a grace note on the C, and we lift and then close down. We don't play a grace note and then down like that, which causes a whole heap of crossing noises and a muffled grace note that comes in between. So instead of it's all right, subtle difference, but it's often the difference between a, a quality sounding tecum and a poor sounding one. I presume you play them the same, Gary? Uh, that's a leading question, Brett. <laughs> when I was taught in my heyday, which is... Um, you know, some years ago, um, I was actually taught to play my C tacums with an open C. It's yes. very hard to change. Yeah. Um, that said, I wouldn't ask any of my students to play them with an open C today. Getting the sequence of your finger movements optimized, if you like, done the best 
best order of events, lift up the D finger and then go for the swap into the next note. Those things are key to getting rid of crossing sounds. Absolutely. No, no doubt about that. Yep, absolutely. Well, um, I think we've covered most of what we should cover in... Um, one in, question. Uh, yes, yep, one question. Yeah, there's a question that, and it actually comes back to another. We haven't really looked at the, uh, the relative tempos of the, uh, the three idioms in the set. Um, the relative tempos? Yeah, there's a question asked, what would, a, what would a typical march tempo be if your stress bay is, say, at 120? What might it be? Um, I think you've got a fair amount of leeway, but I think, again, this is the same sort of question we had when we talked about marches. I think, again, you could be playing in a grade four band and you could be playing a, a, a march at quite a low tempo, but it could be too fast for the band. So you'll get a comment from the judges saying this tune is too fast and yet you're actually playing it at quite a slow tempo. Um, so I think that there's, there's a, huge, a huge range that I think is going to be acceptable between the grades. So, you know, I don't tend to look at metronome readings, but, you know, if you were playing a, a march at a tempo which was you know, 68 beats a minute or something like that, I think you're looking at a, 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 a moderate to slow march. If you were playing your march up in the, in the high 70s, high 80s, I think you're looking at a fairly brisk sort of march. Um, if you're doing that, you should be playing a reasonably brisk stress space. So you're probably up in the 120s. Um, you know, maybe 124 or something like that. If you're playing up around the, the, the 80 beats a minute for a march and, and if you're playing, if you're moving on to the reel again, you should be, you know, again, the 80 beats a minute for the, for the march about the, for the reel about the same as you're playing with the march. Now they're really rough guides, you know, you you have to listen to what the band's doing and come out with something that balances between the three. Um, you know, people like numbers. You know, I hear people quoting yeah. metronome numbers and, and tuner numbers and all sorts of things all the time. But at the end of the day, you know, it's what you're hearing. You know, if you're a judge, you're hardly going to turn around and say that, um, that it's a, a it's a slow tempo for a march. If it's played uh, in a in a clean fashion, it's nicely played and it's controlled. You obviously don't want to be dirge like, but you know if a band's if a band's playing well within their capabilities, I don't think that you're going to get too many criticisms that something's too slow, unless of course you're playing it really well and the judge thinks, well, you know that is quite slow but very well played and it could be played at a faster tempo within the capabilities of the band. So you would give a band playing a march at 68 very capably and very controlled a different comment than you would give a band coming up playing 68 beats a minute and it was tatty and untidy. Agreed. You'd agree with that, I think, Gary? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a saying I've just invented and that is that expression beats tempo hands down. Oh, absolutely. You know, if you're playing cleanly and well and you're playing with expression, I think that's a bigger consideration than, than tempo. But in saying, you've got to be within the capabilities, within the realms of, of the tempos that the idioms fit within. You know, you don't want to be coming up playing a stress bay and having it slower than you march or something. I mean, that'd just be silly. So yeah, you've got room, room to manoeuvre, but within the capabilities of what the, the player or the band's playing, you don't expect the same tempos to be played in elementary as you would in, in open or D grade and A grade, whatever we want to call them currently. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah, sure. Sure. Well, if there's no more questions there, I think we'll call it an evening.